So yeah, thanks for thanks for the introduction, and it's exciting to be here, and and really incredible to see such a large crowd. Uh, these are the wonders of of these modern Zoom meetings. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm Matthew Hutchings, um, and and I'm the chief product officer at Seek, which means I get the the fun job of of hanging out with our partners and getting customers to understand how to build quantum computers that, that meet their needs. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about um, you know how we build what we class as a truly digital quantum computer. Um, so first off, um, you know, I'd like to give a bit of introduction to who we are. Um, so we're not your, your conventional kind of startup. We're a, we're a spin out from a company called Hypris, um, and Hypris was a, a, it still is a world leader in commercial superconducting uh, systems, um, and invented um, one of these technologies, the the RSFQ technology. And one of our co-founders was a co-inventor of this technology. Um, and we are set and Hypris themselves spun out of IBM in the early 80s. Um, and what this means is we, you know, we've we've spun out and you know, from a company that has actually built systems from concept chips through to devices, through to full systems, and then sold them commercially to customers. Um, so we have a, a you know a strong commercialization and heritage behind us. Um, and we also have um, a multi-chip, uh, multi-layer commercial superconducting foundry, which is one of the only commercial foundries of its kind in, in the world. Um, and, and it was a significant asset. Um, and, and with that, we were able to, to raise a, a good amount of venture capital for some really strong um, backing uh, by EQT and, and Blue Yard and FAM and, and other strategic investors um, in Merck and, and LG Ventures. Um, and, and with that, we've, we've, we've got gained 20 employees to date and, and a number of uh, of issued patents, um, and we also have a really, really great team of, of 17 or so PhDs. So, so it's great to not be the smartest in the room when I when I'm when I'm working with this team. Um, and also, uh, I guess quite uniquely, is on day one, even for a smallish company, we have a global footprint, and that's because we see quantum computing as an opportunity is global, um, and your customers are going to be global, and you've got partnerships that are global. Um, so we have we have some really really exciting partnerships uh, with academics, universities. We've got our headquarters in the in the US. Uh, we also have a really cool um, and found uh, facility in Naples, um, and that's closely partnered with the university and one of our academic advisors there. Um, and in the UK, we're just about to uh, towards the end of the year finish a state of the art test facility right in the centre of London. Uh, where we're going to work on some of our customer projects so some exciting work um, and and before we dig into the kind of future of, of quantum computing we I, I like to start with you know why are we doing this and from our perspective and and ultimately you know the cliche of, of essentially nature is not a classical system so you shouldn't be simulating it with a classical computer you need to build a quantum computer uh, to truly simulate nature and I think that's that's the excitement behind why we're here today and, and ultimately what we want to do we're not we're not we're here to learn about how to build quantum computers but really we want to solve problems um, and some of the some of the exciting problems we want to solve um, are in, in in really transformative areas of, of of the world so so you know things that will really impact society um, and this is kind of the excitement that I'm, you know, getting into quantum computing for these kind of reasons. Um, so, you know, just as a, as a simple headline, like if, if we could build a powerful enough quantum computer that has 28, 286 qubits, um, and they can be all entangled and, and working together in harmony, um, then it could potentially simulate something that would take a significant amount of classical compute to, to replicate. Um, so that's the kind of, you know, power comparison, but of course, actually, you know, this power is only really useful for very, very specific, very particular applications. Um, and and as, as we heard from the IQM uh, team, is that that you've got to be very careful and, and targeting with your with your application that you go after. And we are we are partnered with um, with some great um, uh, great companies to to really make sure we're tailored in our applications. Um, so again, before digging into the future of quantum computing, we like to look at kind of the past of classical computing uh, to preface uh, where we need to go. And ultimately, um, you start out with the, the early classical computers, and this is the ENIAC, uh, and this was a, something like a 20-bit system. Um, and you're looking at, at all of these kind of wiring and complexity and overhead. And, and the reason we talk about this is because history is essentially repeating itself. 
Um, and so you're looking at today's state-of-the-art computer, quantum computer, and th this is the Google machine that, that John Martinez uh, was, was discussing earlier. And this is a fantastic piece of technology that, that can make a very large scale quantum processor and have it all working together and, and be able to do something that, that would take a classical computer a very long time. Um, but in order to make that, that system work, you need all of this overhead, these, these lots of wiring going inside the fridge. This is the central thing is that, that fridge that gets the qubits cold, uh, but you have all this room temperature electronics that, that, that need to support those, those delicate qubits. Um, and this ultimately is a very complex and very difficult to manufacture system. So, so it's fantastic for these kind of demonstrations of, of potential to build quantum computers, but, but in our vision, it's not, it's not how you're going to productize quantum computers and make it as a service. Um, but if you, you know, ultimately, this is a system that you could scale, and, and we've heard some really exciting work from IBM themselves about how they're going to scale uh, such systems towards a thousand qubits or greater. Um, and you see this kind of, they call it the super fridge um, with this giant, giant fridge technology. And also you've got some great work out of um, Andreas Woolroth's group where you can connect multiple fridges together with superconducting interconnects. Um, and so that's some really exciting work, but ultimately we see this as kind of like a, a brute force approach to scaling these systems, you know, whatever, whatever needs, just get more wires in that fridge and make it a bigger fridge. Um, so instead, you know, we want to think about the, the, how to manufacture the system in, in a different math method. Um, and for that, uh, we've created um, uh, and tested and built the, um, the first kind of integrated quantum module. So this takes a lot of that room temperature overhead that you see in, in the previous photo and distills it down to a single chip or a handful of chips uh, that directly communicate with the qubits um, in, inside the fridge and they can be co-located. Um, so this is the first of its kind that's a truly integrated uh, quantum processor module. Um, and what, what it means is, is a system that can essentially, um, we can digitally control um, qubits instead of using uh, microwave radiation. And I'll get on to about, a bit about how we do that and why it's important. Uh, but what from a system level, what this really means is we can, we can integrate by integrating a lot of the control, we can reduce a lot of the, the overheads and the latency involved with controlling uh, these delicate quantum computers. Um, we can reduce their, their impact of environmental noise because we're having less uh, impact from the, from the room temperature systems. Um, and we can reduce, significantly reduce dis heat dissipation uh, and noise um, compared to analog systems. And this is particularly important when you're working in a cryogenic superconducting environment where everything's got to stay very, very cold. Um, so so what does the, what's the core behind this? This, this concept. So we have this digital quantum management system. And what it does is it takes that, that core technology that was invented by one of our co-founders, uh, Oleg Mukhanov, the sing, uh, rapid single flux quantum technology, um, and just drives a qubit uh, with single flux quantum pulses. And, and the, the, the pulses are so short in, in time, one picosecond compared to the, the frequency of the qubit, um, that the qubit just sees this digital pulse of energy. Um, and if you time that, that energy very precisely, um, which we can do with our very high clock speeds, um, you, can, you can step the qubit along its block sphere um, and ultimately create digital control. Um, and this is some, some work from one of our collaborators uh, a while uh, in 2019 showing that if you take a, this is your classic Rabi oscillation of a qubit, um, and you're moving your you know, qubit from zero to one on the block sphere, that if you zoom right in, sorry, uh, you can actually see the quantization the stepping of the of this of this qubit as it block as it steps through the block sphere, which is some really exciting work to show that we really are digitally controlling uh, these qubits. Um, so with that, we also you know this digital controller can actually be scaled up to a full classical processor. So we're not just using a, a digital interface for our qubits; we're building a classic a, a set of classical coprocessor chips. Um, uh, that, that operate using the similar you know, SFQ core technology. Um, but the beauty of these systems is because they're superconducting and because they, they rely on this, uh, a different type of Joseph's injunction technology, uh, they can operate ex at extremely high speeds. Um, so, so tens of gigahertz and beyond, which is you know, tens of times faster than, than you know, classical data centers and, and, and computers that exist today. And this, this, gives, this is a really important system because you know, we can co-locate these with the qubits inside the fridge. 
Um, and ultimately, you know, some of the things we heard uh, from, from John Martinez is when you scale up these things, you need to really have very low latency and very high speed classical support and, uh, to make sure that these, this system, you know, the quantum system can work. And this is what this coprocessor can provide and it can be co-located. Um, so we're building this truly hybrid quantum classical system, um, which, which Jay Gambetta was talking about how important such a, such a system is. Um, so this is our kind of our vision for a for an actual chip-based integrated quantum computing system, um, and you can see it's it's as much of the we're putting as much of the controller as we can inside the fridge, um, and reducing a lot of the wiring overhead in the sit the room temperature overhead, um, it down, distilling it down into a sequence of chips that we can print, refabricate, and and reconnect these uh, more more readily. Um, but we're not the only people in town uh, building uh, integrated type circuits. Uh, we heard a bit from, from Jake and Better about cryogenic CMOS as an alternative approach to, to room temperature electronics. Um, and, you know, it's a great technology, but, but ultimately we see it, it's not, it's, it's, not, it's not the answer to all of the issues that you need to uh, figure out with solving these things, because ultimately the key things are it's still an analog control technology, so you don't you don't get the the advantages of digitization, where you can massively multiplex, massively reduce the number of wires that are needed to control qubits. Um, it's also um, ultimately you're taking a cryogenic CMOS processor, cooling it down to very low temperature, where it doesn't like to operate, and these things naturally operate quite hot. Um, and so, so it's taking a lot of compromises in its, in its performance and its frequency that it operates at. So these things operate very slowly. And, and as we see, superconducting qubits, in order, the classical coprocessor needs to actually operate very fast to keep up with the qubit technology. Um, so so a, slow, a slow coprocessor isn't, is only going to be so helpful. And it also dissipates an enormous amount of heat, which, which ultimately can overload the, the, the cooling capacity of your fridge quite rapidly. Um, so, so like I said, We've got, we think that the, the superconducting approach is, is the way to do this. And ultimately, you know, we could, we can interface with cryogenic CMOS as well. So it's not, you know, we can do both if we need. Um, but the key to being integrated and, and ultimately digital, and that's the critical thing is by digitizing the system, we can, we can turn the class, you know, the delicate quantum states into a classical answer as quickly and precisely as possible. Um, and by doing, and once we've digitized the output, then we can massively multiplex. And what this really means is we're solving um, this old uh, rents rule problem that was, uh, it was coined in Bell Labs uh, by, the, by the, the head of Bell Labs in the, in the early 80s, talking about when you're building these early classical computers and they called it the tyranny of numbers, that every time you, you added a bit of classical performance, you'd add, have to add a wire um, or two or three just to get the thing controlled. Um, and this tyranny of numbers meant that ultimately that they could never envisage how you would commercially build a large scale classical computer, which we know isn't true. Um, and the answer was to go to an integrated circuit. Um, and by integrating the circuit, they can massively multiplex the control overhead. Um, and that's what we're doing with our integrated circuit. So if you compare to, to some kind of the Google numbers of how they control their quantum processor systems, again, we have this problem that, that every time you add uh, a qubit, you add some more wires. Um, and, and that works up to many thousands of qubits could, you know, it could, could deliver, but, but ultimately to scale to millions of qubits or, or tens of thousands of qubits even, we need this integrated approach. And you can see the stark difference here that, that you know, every time we add a new qubit, we don't have to add an additional wire. Um, and actually, as you add more and more qubits, you add fewer and fewer wires. Um, and it's this multiplexing, this digitization that, that's critical to scaling um, these quantum computers. Um, and also, you know, along with this, this digitization, we also uh, come along with, with some other advantages. So this is just a direct comparison of kind of uh, analog to digital technology. So we've got much faster clock speeds, uh, much lower power dissipation per qubit. And that's critical for, for remembering that these things need to stay cold. So if we're gonna still put them in, in single fridges, we need, we need them to be very low powered. Um, and the key point here is that um, we're trying to lower the cost per qubit to a manufacturable level, that, that we don't need tens of thousands of dollars per qubit to operate them. Um, so just some high level figures, you know, I won't labor these points, but I think the key point here again is that that cheaper, that, that hitting that manufacturability of these systems is critical to our, 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 our process. Um, 
So just to finish off, um, we wanted to show off some some kind of recent results, um, and and you know we've got this this multi-chip module, which a lot of you know it's quite a critical. We've heard a lot about how critical that is to going to to be able to three-dimensionally control your qubits. Um, so we have our own integrated uh, technology, and we have a unique um, multi-chip module technology that's that's true that's fully superconducting, and that allows us to do a little bit more interesting control methods. And we put our superconducting controller directly onto the onto the the, the, the control chip, um, and we've been able to demonstrate within this 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 architecture um, state-of-the-art coherences and gate fidelities. Um, and we're also working with with the kind of state of the art two qubit gate. So this is the two qubit gate that we've heard a lot about from from John Martinez, uh, where you have this 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 qubit coupler, um, and then you can tune the qubit coupler so you can turn on and off the the qubit interaction. And this is really a, a great, a fantastic gate. It's been proven to have some of the best best two qubit fidelities out there. Um, and and it's extremely fast gate, um, and it also reduces a lot of the crosstalk kind of challenges. Um, and just to show some nice pretty features of of turning on and off uh, qubit interactions, uh, which I always like to see. Any form of Rabi fringe is is fun. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks for listening. And and um, you know if you want, we're, just to say we're also we're also hiring. So if you want to come join um, our efforts to to build and get some more of that incredible data. Uh, you know, feel free to give me an email or, or email us at jobs.seek.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Um, let's see if there are uh, questions. So, so one question that comes into mind. Um, so you, you're applying very short pulses. Um, doesn't that limit you in terms of, you know, fidelities uh, because you're coupling to, you know, extraneous levels uh, in the transmon? Yeah, it's a really good question. So, so, so if we were to use a naive kind of pulse train, then absolutely. Um, so, we, we if it, if you were to to coherently drive, as as we call it, um, qubits with with resonant pulses. So, so the the distance between the pulse is resonant with the qubit precession. Um, then, yeah, because you've got a very sharp delta function, you're radiating a very broad band, you qubit with very broad band frequency, um, and so so that would. You know, ultimately uh, lead to highlights, high lying state population, um, and and you could, but even with that, you can still reach you know high nine, you know high ninety nine plus percent uh, fidelity. Um, but to go beyond that, what we need to do and what we are doing is is using a non resonant pulse train. So you can you change the distance between each pulse, um, and you can do these different walks on the block sphere essentially, uh, and by and by breaking up that. That distance between the the pulse strain, uh, you you no longer have this resonant, you know, broadband frequency tone. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, 